As we come to the third lecture in Handout Theology, God is Love, let us take a moment to ask him his blessing. God, we know thou art love, and we know that thou dost love to bless. And that's our petition now, that thou will bless us even as we study about thee in thy inmost loving nature. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let me once again read these ten propositions without comment and then return to develop some of them more fully. Thank God God is moral. We have seen that he is being and all that goes with that. Two, but suppose with all his natural attributes of infinitude, all comprehendingness, omnipresence, omniscience, omnipotence, he were a God of hate, a non-moral being, an evil being, a cosmic terrorist. Three, the excellency of God is that his morality is as perfect as his power, his love as deep as his wisdom. Without his moral attributes, God would be the great but not the good. And we would be miserable, for he would have no concern for us. He would be the great unconcerned. For God is love. You can tell it by looking at yourself. The one who made you made a magnificently functioning spiritual being, housed in a magnificent temple in which to dwell the days of your years. We are not the product of the great unconcerned. Five, but when I wrote those words at 74 years of age, I could hardly breathe and couldn't sit without distress on one, only one small part of my anatomy. But if I and you knew nothing of God but our own existence, we would know without argument that he's a God of love. Six, if God is a God of love, we would be almost certain without divine revelation that he is triune. At least we would know that there must be another in the eternal Godhead, in eternal being, to love, and another to bind the two together, somewhat like the human family, which came from him, from them, Seven, everywhere in the vast created universe are tokens of a creator's love for his creation, especially for those who could understand it and return it. Eight, and again, so obvious, what alone can make the creation happy? Love among the creatures is God among the creatures. Nine, but now the problem. If God is love, whence the suffering, agony, death? Ten. This is the moral question to which we now come in the next lecture. But let's notice first of all that God is moral. We've seen he is being, and all that goes with that, and morality goes uh, with it. God is is being. And we've shown that being includes mind, and we know that being also has love and needs love, and that that love and morality, conscience, must come from somewhere because it's a part of our nature. We've already seen and we don't have anything that we haven't received from him in whom we live and move and have our being. Now we notice that God is moral being because all beings of a rational character have a moral sensitivity, a moral desire, and show a character that they could only have gotten from this ultimate being who must indeed himself be moral. I don't think I have to go through the same pattern of thought again, do I, that we went through with respect to 
accounting for man's rationality. There's no place from which it could come except this ultimate being. And we also know we are moral beings. And if we know rationality could only come from this being, we are all the more certain that morality could only come from him. Nevertheless, in number two, we speculate on another horrible possibility, rational possibility that, thank God, we can eradicate. Suppose with all his natural attributes of infinitude, all comprehendingness, omnipresence, omniscience, omnipotence, he were a God of hate, a non-moral being, an evil being, a cosmic terrorist. As you know, I suppose, there are people who think that, especially when they've had some grim experience of their own. They sometimes feel that the only explanation can be an evil being at the heart of things. It's been a very common philosophical notion that there has been a good and evil striving for the victory. And some people who would never deny the idea that the ultimate being is good seem to feel driven to say here his counterpart is also evil. And the great struggle of everything in the universe is for the triumph of one or the other. And some hopefully triumph, hopefully trust in the triumph of the good. Others feel more realistic when they accept what they feel is inevitable, the triumph of the evil. But at any rate, we recognize there's enough evil in the world that it does raise the question, which is a hypothetical possibility at the outset, that this God is some sort of terrorist. He gets his kicks, not out of blessing, but of cursing, not out of helping, but of hindering, not of making live, but actually destroying. Suppose that were the case. Let's face it, a very unpleasant thing to face, actually horrifying to face. Most of us couldn't even think about it for more than a few minutes just to let it pass through our mind as a sort of theoretical metaphysical option that we just can't live with. And so let's think of it for a moment. Is it possible that the ultimate being is evil or at least has an ingredient of evil that it can't undercome, overcome? Plato, you know, the greatest thinker of all times perhaps, felt there was something in the highest good, the divine being, that it itself couldn't overcome. They've had their modern descendants and people who champion the idea of a finite God, a God who after all isn't infinite and isn't omnipotent, but has forces over which he must gain the victory and would run the risk of actual defeat. Number three, the excellency of God is that his morality, not his immorality, his morality is as perfect as his power, his love as deep as his wisdom. Without his moral attributes, God would be great but not good, and we would be miserable for he would have no concern for us. He would be the great unconcerned. I'm asking you now, since the question has been raised, whether it's possible that God is immoral rather than moral, a great evil being or a being who can overcome evil in his being, all right, let's face it. But if that were the case, as I'm saying here in number three item, we wouldn't have any evidence of the kind of love we have which triumphs over everything and which gives us consolation in the midst of any kind of suffering. We'll have to face that question later on. How, if this is an omnipotently good being, there could be any suffering at all? I'm simply saying at this point in our odyssey of thought that we know one thing, that God is not the great unconcern, that this suffering which he allows, this evil which comes into his universe is allowed for some sort of purpose because we can't escape the conviction even as we look at ourselves 
that he is a good, moral, loving being. Number four, God is love. You can tell it, I say, by looking at yourself. The one who made you made a wonderfully functioning spiritual being, housed in a magnificent temple in which to dwell the days of your years. We are not the product of the great unconcern. Is that not obvious? I say that to people who have suffered tremendously, who even now may be in unspeakable agony. Isn't that true that you have been greatly blessed and that you realize even on a bed of pain that the life which this great being has given you has been a good life fundamentally? I remember one woman I knew of casually who had been afflicted with an ailment that the doctors told me made her suffer without intermission for some 10 years. And yet every time I ever had the opportunity of seeing her, all she could say is how good God was, how wonderful it was to be with him on a bed of pain. The pain made her heart sing rather than sink. And I maintain anybody who realizes who's behind all of this, it would make the heart sing rather than sink. And you would sense. See, I, th I hope you notice, uh, class, the way we proceed here. I'm anticipating as I go along so that you'll be thinking in advance of topics which will be focused upon later on. Right now, we're looking at a side glance at the problem of evil, and we're saying this much before we concentrate on it more precisely, that somehow this evil must be good. Some way or other, this ultimate being who is the great concerned must have allowed this to come into our universe, not been obliged to do so, because he is the only being, he is the ultimate power, he is the sovereign mind. So he must have allowed this to come into the universe for some good purpose. At the moment, we don't know what the purpose could be, but we realize the nature of this being, being what it is, the suffering that does exist must be some way permitted by him, and if permitted by him, you know. It's for the good of those who suffer. Number five, I'm just taking myself as an example here. When I wrote those words at 74 years of age, I could hardly breathe and I couldn't sit without distress but on one small part of my anatomy. And nevertheless, I at that time and you, it's suffering far worse than that, knew nothing of God but our own existence, we would know without argument that he is a God of love. There's a temptation for us, of course, when we're being put through the providential ringer to raise these questions about God and to wonder how he can be God. But in our sober moments, when we think seriously about it, just as I was thinking as I was gasping for breath, which isn't any fun, I'd rather breathe easily, but I wasn't breathing easily, and I wouldn't have been having difficulty with my breathing if the great I am had not permitted it. But at the same time, I was confident enough that just the goodness he'd shown me in my very existence, it was good for me to have some hard breathing. And it's good for that friend in Cambridge to have suffered as she did. It's good that there should be evil. Somehow or other, we know that's the case. How? We'll examine more carefully later on, but I'm just simply saying in passing the fact that it looks as if this world is out of whack in some ways, and the comedian could say there's a destiny that shapes our ends rough, hew them how we may, rather than the poet's word, there's a destiny that shapes our ends, rough hew them where we may. We know that somehow or other it is not the intention of God, this ultimate being, to shape our ends rough. I mean, to make everything work out for evil. It may do that, but we are convinced at this particular stage that is not, couldn't be, the original divine intention. Number six, 
If God is a God of love, we would be almost certain without revelation that he is triune. At least we would know that there must be another in the eternal Godhead to love and another to bind the two together, somewhat like the human family which came from him, from them, a man, a wife, a child, a father, a son, a Holy Spirit. Even without biblical revelation, we could imagine there was something like that. A powerful theologian I know once went through a period of profound doubt and heresy when he virtually became a Unitarian, denying the divinity of Christ and of the Holy Spirit. What brought him back again to the Orthodox Trinitarianism he now teaches was the fact that he couldn't get over the idea that a God of love wouldn't have multiple beings. He just couldn't live with the notion there'd be only one person in the Godhead if that person was love. There would have to be an object. And though the Bible teaches that plainly, as we'll see, this man wasn't driven to it by the Bible so much as the, the very fact that God is love it would have to be so. And then we can see how families would be named after him. A husband and a wife come together in love and they generate a child, which is especially the bond of their love. And it's just so almost exactly a pattern of the divine trinity that there can't be any doubt that God made us the way we did for the purpose of intimating at least his divine triune existence. Seven, everywhere in the vast created universe are tokens of a creator's love for his creation, especially for those who could understand it and return it. Will anyone deny that? Everywhere, the grass that grows, the birds that fly, the brooks that run, and every solitary part of this ecological universe of ours is a benefit to man. We're very conscious of that in this age because we seem to be careless about its use and losing many of these manifest benefits of the divine love. But if we're afraid of losing them by our own carelessness and prodig prodigality, we are saying at the same time, we are disrespecting the deity from which they must have come because they say so loudly and so indisputably that he is a loving being and there's some lovelessness in us if we trample underfoot the gifts of his love to us. Number nine, but now the problem. If God is love, whence the suffering, agony, death? As I mentioned in the next point, that's what we come to in the next lecture, but let's feel it right now. If God is love and there is suffering, how is that possible? You remember when we were wrestling in the earlier lectures with the idea of an ultimate being, the objection was fundamentally the idea was so overwhelming, we almost couldn't live with it, and we almost preferred these infinite regresses and circular reasonings rather than come to the inevitable conclusion. Now, when it comes to the morality of the divine being, we have a problem far more overwhelming than the one for the rationality of being. And that is, of course, the existence of evil. We cannot deny that it does exist. And it has bad consequences. And we'll learn from the Bible it has even eternally bad consequences. But even if we had no further revelation than that, we know full well that evil constitutes a problem if a person is going to maintain 
that the God who made this world is a moral being. The philosophers in the company here will agree with me emphatically. They will say that is the problem. That is the most excruciating problem in all of thought. And some of them will go so far as to say there is no answer for it. Now, before we listen to them, we've got to know there must be an answer for it. But at the moment, it looks as if they're right. You can't have a good God who's all-powerful and at the same time permits uni uh, evil in his universe. The usual saying is this. If God is good, as we like to think, if good, he cannot be all-powerful. Philosophical halls are places of vast difference. There's very little agreement among these deep thinkers of our society. But there's a kind of unanimity on this point. I don't know that I've ever met a non-Christian philosopher, at least, who wouldn't say the same thing. If God is good, he cannot be omnipotent. You may say, let's toy with the idea you have that the God of heaven and earth, the ultimate being, the I am, who exists in and of himself without beginning or end or change, is really good. Plato entertained that idea, and a good many philosophers entertained that idea. And we tried to show in our preliminary lectures that no other idea tenable. He's the source of all morality. We don't know any, what, what good is, except as he has made us sensitive to it in our own being and in the world around us. He's a God of love. He's a good God. All right, the skeptics will say, let's assume that. Let's go along with you. Let's believe that the God of heaven and earth is good. No evil in him. No animosity. All blessing, no curse. Let's go along with that. Then you know full well he would produce good and not evil if he were able to. If we assume he's good, we will all assume that everything he does is good and will be beneficial. And these people, you've said Gerstner, are made in his image and so on and come from this ultimate being and so on and are the only ones who can understand him and so on. They must be blessed by him. They must receive from him good and nothing but good. Even that little pain you talked about, a trifle of being, finding it hard to breathe at certain time or to sit on your spine in a certain position and so on, even that. Where would it come from, Gerstner? If this God you believe in is good and able to do the good, and unable to do any evil, and if there was anything in the universe, this other being you talk about, which I grant you couldn't possibly exist, but at any rate, if there was ever any evil in the universe, this being could immediately extinguish it because he's not only good, he is the Lord God omnipotent who reigneth. He would expunge it from the pages of human history immediately you would always breathe easily, Gerstner. Nobody would ever have cancer. There would be no hurricanes. There would be no tornadoes. There would be no wars. There wouldn't be any of these things if God was both good and all-powerful. Now, you have to realize that. You're trying to be a frank theologian, Gerstner this handout theology series, you're trying to start from scratch, look at the world as it actually is. All right, now here's a test of whether you'll stick to your candor and follow the evidence where it leads. Don't you have to admit that if this God you talk about is a moral being 
and therefore a good being, then he can't have those qualities you thought he had when you described this ultimate being who is a powerful source of everything, in whom we live and move and have our being, who preserves us and all things else. Make your choice, Gerstner. If God is good, he is not omnipotent. If he is omnipotent, he's not good. One of them has to go. You can't have both. You're trying to be a frank thinker. You're trying to face the evidence honestly. Now, honestly, Gerstner, can you conceivably say that this God you have been establishing is also a moral God in the face of the evidence? Don't you have to admit that as soon as you say he is a moral God, you've got problems? And if you're going to say that, you're going to have to stop talking the way you were. And if you're going to be the consistent person you think you are and continue with what you think you have established, then God's goodness has to go. Now make up your mind, Gerstner, and you other Christian people who think this way, and other theists as well who think this way, one or the other. Either God is good and not omnipotent, or he is omnipotent and he is not good. Now that's the problem as we see it. As I say, in many ways, class, it is the most excruciating problem that we face in the general world, in the philosophical world, and it requires a very honest facing, and we have to give an answer to it or admit that if we have no answer for it, God's goodness has to go or his omnipotence has to go. I just want you to feel the problem now, and I'm giving you any relief at the moment, but in the next lecture we'll face it even more closely and try to indicate what the answers are.